Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our series, Great Ideas in Psychology. We have reached chapter nine, which is called Stage Models of Development. So the chapter is about development, psychological development to be specific, and a kind of thinking about psychological development, a kind of theorizing, a kind of making theory that uses stages. So when we think about development in terms of stages, we are dividing the process of development into distinct parts with boundaries between different stages. We want to get a general flavor of this kind of theorizing, this kind of model, with the help of four example, four classic theories of stage development, stage-based development. And we want to talk about and highlight the assumptions that go into this kind of model, this kind of theory. All right, let's go to the slides. Here we are, the book again, Great Ideas in Psychology by Fatali Muaddam. Chapter nine, stage models of development. This is our place in the general map of the series. After this will come uh, a response to you know, parts of what we cover in this chapter by another thinker. This chapter begins with a really nice example of the life of a butterfly as you know, getting into thinking about stages, in thinking about development in terms of stages. So we can divide life of a butterfly into four stages. And these four stages are very visibly, very clearly distinct from each other. We can tell that the difference between stages is not a matter of degrees, but it is a matter of kinds, a different kind of form of life. So we get the egg, that's stage one, then the caterpillar, then the chrysalis, and then the adult butterfly emerges from the chrysalis. These are visibly distinct stages. When we move to human life, and especially psych the psychology of human beings, we are not dealing with stages that are as clearly different from each other as the life of a butterfly. But stage theories have their appeal even with humans, even with human psychology. Because when we have stages, when we believe in stages, when we work with stages, these stages and stage theories make life predictable. And because they are predictable, because we have stages, we know what comes next. We are not, we at least we feel like we won't be surprised. So just in general, thinking about human life, we can chronologically divide human life into stages from infancy to old age. But of course, this is not what we are talking about as students of psychology. As students of psychology, we are not just interested in the chronology of human life and human development. We are interested in human psychological life and whether or not there are stages in the life of the mind, the life of the psyche, human psyche. There are many people, many theorists, many psychologists who have proposed stage theories. And these four are probably the most well-known among them. Sigmund Freud, Eric Erickson, Jean Piaget, and Lawrence Kohlberg. You can contrast these theories with more continuous models of development where in those models, we say that there are no clear boundaries between different parts, different periods in the human life. Now, in the book, if you, if you read the chapter in the book, you read that Piaget and Kohlberg have had the greatest impact within academic disciplines, academic psychology, whereas Freud has had a wider influence in popular culture as well. But all of these four are quite well known. Before getting into Freud's theory, let's talk about the assumptions that these types of theories are uh, are committed to. So they all say that we are integrating, by talking about these stages, we are integrating different levels of analysis. We're integrating the biological processes, psychological processes, and social processes. And each stage is reflecting all of these levels. When a person going, is going through one stage to a next stage, uh, that is reflecting changes in biology, psychology, and the relationship between the person, the organism, the human being, and the social context. So that integration is something that 
is valued in these theories. They also assume that the shift from one stage to another stage represents a qualitative shift. Another assumption is that in each case, in the, in the case of each theory, uh, there is a fixed hierarchy and that healthy development is a one directional movement through this hierarchy. If you go back to a previous stage, that is not healthy. That is regression and it's going back. It's not, that doesn't represent healthy development. So fixed hierarchy also means that you can't jump from stage one to stage four. You have to go through stage one, two, three uh, in that order, in the order that the theory proposes. They also assume a kind of universality that cuts across cultures. So stage theories say that our proposals, our ideas are not specific to any given culture. You can make these similar observations even in, if you change the, the culture within which you are observing. So let's begin with more specific, you know, a, a very superficial uh, glance at Freud's theory. Freud's theory is a theory of psychosexual development, and it is based on the idea that the libidinal energy is being expressed in, in terms of and being, being focused on uh, particular erogenous zones at each stage. So when you go from one stage of psychosexual development in Freud's theory to another stage, there will be a shift in the, that place in the body that is expressing the libidinal energy that is most sensitive, that is most involved in experiencing sensual, sensual pleasures. The development of human instinct, it, there's a biological aspect to this. There's a biological programming and determinism in it. But at the same time, when a child goes through each stage, that stage represents a way of relating to the world and relating to other people, parents, other kids. So the so-called anal stage, which is, which is the second stage, is not just about focusing on an area, uh, one erogenous zone, and that's the only defining feature. No, it also has a theme in relation to what the, the child is focused on, namely control. In the anal stage, it's about control and the significance of control, learning about control. In the phallic stage, the third stage, it is about the relation between the child and the parents of the opposite sex, at least according to Sigmund Freud. In the latency period, it, it is about that the theme of that in terms of the, the activity of that phase is the relationship between the child and the peers around the same age. And there's no conscious sexual feeling. And finally, in the genital period, the final uh, stage in Freud's theory, it is about a um, relationship with person that will, be a, that will become a romantic partner, or at least a potential romantic partner. Freud's theory ends uh, around puberty or, or in late adolescence, maybe we can say at most early adulthood. So in response to that limitation, Eric Erickson proposed his own stage model of development, which one of the advantages of it is that it goes to all the way to old age and it has eight stages instead of four. A beautiful aspect of Erickson's stage model is that he characterizes each stage as a crisis. So he says that throughout a person's life, each of us, we have to go through uh, each phase and we have to face a crisis and we can we have we, we can resolve that crisis either in a in an ad adaptive way or in a maladaptive way and erickson said that the first stage is about establishing trust general trust in the world not just trust in the parents but trust in the world that's a fundamental relationship that the child forms with the rest of reality the second stage again there's a crisis between you know, on the one hand, we, can, we have the potential to develop a sense of autonomy. On the other hand, we can fall into a feeling of shame. Third stage, again, the crisis. And now we can either develop a sense of initiative. There's a feeling of possibility. I can initiate activities or a sense of guilt. Now, one of the advantages of Erickson's stage model is that it allows us a way of thinking about these feelings, these emotional dispositions, as more or less fundamental, more or less deeply ingrained in the person's life. So for example, which one is 
deeper? Which feeling is deeper according to Erickson's theory? Shame or guilt? Which one is more ingrained? Which one is, uh, has a deeper role in coloring a person's experiences? Erickson would, sh- would say it is shame. Why? Because shame is an earlier crisis. It is something that is resolved and established earlier. If a person falls into shame, that shame has a more fundamental, more deep-seated place in a, in a person's life experience, psychological life, mental life. Guilt also is a very, relatively speaking, is uh, quite deep-seated compared to inferiority, compared to confusions about identity, compared to isolation. But in relation to each other, shame and guilt, shame is the more fundamental, deep-seated uh, emotional disposition. And the, the deepest feeling, the deepest disposition in relation to the world is trust or mistrust. And the deeper something is, the more difficult it is to change. Because each crisis carries with it the resolutions that have previously happened. If you resolve the first stage uh, not in favor of trust, but with mistrust, then that is carried over in the second crisis. And it, shame becomes um, combined with that sense of mistrust and so on and so forth. So we carry the result of the previous stages as we face the new, each new crisis. So again, as I said before, uh, Erickson's model covers the, the entirety of, tries to cover the entirety of uh, human life until the old age. So in that sense, it is quite good. Similar to Freud, Erickson's model is a psychodynamic model. It tries to capture the the emotional and dramatic aspect of human life. Piaget's theory, by contrast, Jean Piaget, is more modest and it tries to tackle the person's style of knowing, knowledge. In other words, it is trying to describe cognitive abilities. It is divided into four stages, beginning with the sensory motor stage. Again, similar to Freud, similar to Piaget, there's a theme in each stage. There is a a kind of activity. There's a a fundamental way of relating to the world. In a sensory motor stage, that fundamental way of relating to the world is sensory motor. It is based on perceiving things and acting on on objects. During that sensory motor stage, the child is, you know, if assuming that the child goes through a normal process of development, healthy process of development, By the end, the child has a sense of what objects are, what an object is, and learns at the end of that stage that even when you're not looking at the objects, even when an object is invisible for a a time, that object uh, might still be there, might still exist. That is what they refer to as object permanence. It is not there in the first stage, but it emerges in the so-called pre-operational stage. A passage from the textbook. Uh, So we read, quote, for example, four-year-old Samantha can describe in the pre-operational stage uh, the dolls and the dollhouse on the table from where she is sitting, but cannot describe them from the perspective of her sister sitting on the other side of the doll table. So that perspective taking is is missing in the pre-operational stage. And it is also argued that children in the second stage lack uh, the a sense of conservation. So this is uh, one quite relatively well-known demonstration that you have different containers of water. If the containers are the same, the child can judge that, yes, there's similar amount of water in both containers. But if you pour one of the, the, the co- content of one of the containers into a taller glass, a thinner and taller glass, the child might judge that that taller glass now contains more water. Even if you have if you did the transfer right in front of the child, that judgment might still be influenced. This is, of course, up to discussion. Uh, some people believe that the child is misunderstanding the question by the researcher. It's not that the child doesn't know that the water is, um, is not the same amount of water. There is some debate and ambiguity about the meaning of conservation, but there are these, these uh, demonstrations about the pre-operational stage. We can interpret them with respect to some limitations and occasional errors, uh, errors that the child is prone to. Uh, Then we have the third and fourth stages, concrete operational stage and the formal operational stage. In these two stages, the child is now equipped to use concepts, but 
The difference between the third and the fourth stage is that the concepts in the fourth stage could be quite abstract. Let's read another helpful passage from the, this chapter. Quote, Piaget sees the child's thinking as growing less and less egocentric, seeing the world only from her or his point of view and unable to, to take, take on the viewpoint of others, and less based on the concrete experiences of the here and now. Okay, so that was Piaget's theory divided into four stages. As we go from stage one to four, the child is becoming less and less egocentric, less and less attached to his or her particular point of view and can handle experience and thinking about experience with more and more abstract concepts. Inspired by Piaget's theory, Lawrence Kohlberg theorized the development of moral decisions, moral thinking, moral cognition. So Kohlberg's theory is about moral development is inspired by Piaget, and it explains how people make ethical decisions. It cannot really predict what people decide, what they decide to do, but it is more about the process through which they come to a particular decision. And this, uh, this theory proposes three stages, pre-conventional, conventional stage, and then the post-conventional stage. In the beginning, the child is unaware that there are moral conventions, there are ethical conventions, there are things that you're supposed to do, there are values or principles that you're supposed to live by, you're supposed to fulfill. And then the child learns these conventions, but the decisions are completely governed by these conventions and the child cannot think free, freely from them. And then we get to the post-conventional stage where the child can now use the conventions as a reference point, but can deviate from them and act, decide based on alternative principles that sometimes deviate from established conventions, cultural conventions. And I guess that's it. Uh, the Kohlberg's theory could be our last example. Again, what is important here is that all of these theories are proposing a fixed hierarchy, a one directional movement of development, and they are qualitative shifts that happen as the child goes through, or the person goes through one stage to the next stage. There's a, there are some criticisms, as you might expect, of these types of theories, especially with respect to Piaget's theory of cognitive development. We have a great thinker in psychology who proposed alternative ideas by the name Lev Vygotsky. And in our next discussion, we will turn to Vygotsky's idea. Thanks a lot for your attention and uh, until then.